Good morning and uh, welcome to then chapter 3b. And in chapter 3b, we're going to look at the director generals of the BBC, those people who were at the top and yet, of course, did not have the same independence as would uh, the, the chair uh, of a, a big commercial organisation because the government was always there. And although uh, the government could not tell them what to put on the television on Friday afternoon, the government could decide to abolish the BBC uh, or uh, decide to um, reduce the license fee uh, income. So obviously the government had a lot of uh, influence, but indirect influence. So let's have a look at the director generals. Now, there were 12 director generals during our period. Some had more influence than others. And now they obviously in turn could not decide in detail what everybody was going to hear on the radio or see on the television on Tuesday evening. But they did put in place general frameworks of policy. What sort of thing do we never want to see on the television? Do we never want to hear on the radio? Um, for example, uh, uh, before the Second World War, it was very, very difficult to get on the radio if you had a regional accent. Uh, and they could also uh, uh, intervene for the balance of the programmes, you know, how much opera, how much drama, how much documentary, how much lifestyle programming. Yeah? So they, they put in, in place general frameworks, uh, but it tended to be in a, in a supervisory manner. That is to say they would intervene if something went wrong. Uh, rather than intervening every day. So who, who were they then, these 12 director generals? Now, uh, when we look at them, at uh, first glance, we immediately notice that all the director generals for our period were men. Indeed, even today in 2020, there has never been a director general who is a woman. And we are behind, uh, the British are behind the French in this because for the uh, last five years or so, uh, the head uh, of uh, France Television has been a woman called Delphine Ernaut. Uh, what else can we say about these 12 director generals? Well, the vast majority went to private schools. And this is just a symbol or a sign that they were really part of a very small elite. Now, it's very important for French people to remember that in the United Kingdom, the state does not pay the salaries of teachers in private schools, whereas in France, uh, teachers of private school are paid by the state if the school agrees to follow the national curriculum. This is a uh, école privée sous contrat. This doesn't exist in Britain, and therefore parents in the U United Kingdom who send their children to private school must pay the salaries of the teachers. This is obviously very expensive as, as a result, contrary to the stereotype, it is much rarer to go to private school in Britain than it is in France. In fact, today it's around 7% of children go to private schools. And this has been fairly similar uh, between seven and 10% for the last hundred years. And so the fact that almost all the director generals went to private school meant that they all came from the top 10% which obviously is very important when you're talking about uh, a uh, means of communication which is going to talk to uh, the, uh, the millions, talk to the tens of millions. Let's introduce then our uh, director generals uh, one, by, uh, one, one by one. Um, now, why can't I do that? There you go. Uh, uh, and uh, just to remind you, of course, uh, don't forget to visit regularly uh, the teaching blog uh, where you will find uh, endless goodies for you to uh, learn about the BBC, the history of the BBC. So our first uh, uh, director general, I'm going to spend much more time on than the others, because obviously the first one invented the BBC. He didn't put, he didn't make, he didn't establish it, but he invented what it was going to be, in particular in a situation where broadcasting was really completely new and everything needed to be invented. What, what was a news bulletin? Uh, what kind of plays can you put on the, uh, on, on the radio? What is a radio talk? Remember at the time, uh, if you were talking uh, in a conference uh, to a big room, you used a very, very strong voice because there were no microphones in public in 1922. Uh, by, by 1930, they had arrived. Uh, and so speaking on the radio was a whole new, uh, whole, a whole new ball game. So who is this John Reith person? Then you can see him uh, on the right and on the left, a, a bust of him because he's become in some ways a bit of a, a, bit of a British hero. And we, will we shall see uh, how far this is based on uh, an objective judgment about about his, his, his achievements a little later. So he became the director general at the age of 33. 
and he had already been in charge of the company for five years. So he began when he was what, 28 or something, so very, very young to begin. He was privately educated. So from a, 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 an elite Scottish family and trained as an engineer. Uh, and he was also a Presbyterian, a very devout Presbyterian. Now the great historian Asa Briggs said, uh, Reith did not make broadcasting, but he did make the BBC. And also he was a man who changed 20th century British history. Uh, and these two, these two things are no, no doubt true, but of course this does not mean that we should have an uncritical view of him. So what were the most important things about John Reith? Well, certainly religion was extremely important to him. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, politically, he was not involved in politics. He was not interested in, or, in being or, in organized politics, but his, his political, the political opinions he expressed sometime uh, could be uh, really quite worrying. Sorry, I just have to let the cat out. Um, uh, for example, uh, he quite frequently uh, expressed his uh, admiration uh, for uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, and the third thing which I'm going to look at a little bit is uh, his attitude to uh, women working, because although he was uh, uh, very conservative in, in many ways, uh, he uh, was uh, not um, in favour of unequal pay for women. And uh, in particular, he, he wrote, um, the class of women we are now employing is such that they should rank on the same footing as men, which in the 20s was really quite a progressive thing to say. Now, one of these, uh, one of these talented uh, women was uh, Hilda Matheson. That's a picture of her in 1938. Uh, and she was the BBC's first director of talks. Yeah, talks, yeah, so they're inviting experts to speak about their, I'll be with you in a moment, their uh, way. Their, area of expertise. This is just Zoe the cat, okay. Um, very, very important uh, in the radio at the time, uh, the, the director of talks, and, and uh, John Reith went out to find Hilda Matheson, who was a, uh, an assistant to uh, one of the first women members of parliament, uh, because this was the talent he wanted to be in head, uh, ahead of a very important department. So he was uh, prepared to give space for, uh, for female talents. Uh, um, however, uh, and this isn't, we're not surprised to see, um, the, uh, he, there was never a woman on his control board, which was the committee that made the uh, biggest decisions. Uh, another aspect of, uh, uh, of women is that there wasn't a marriage bar uh, in the BBC until 1932. I will come back to that when we talk about the uh, 1930s. Now, a lot of the basic priorities of the BBC had been decided before he arrived in 1922. This is the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, uh, which uh, uh, would uh, become the British Broadcasting Corporation in 1927, although the change was not a huge difference. The staff remained where they were. Uh, that is to say, at the very beginning, before they recruited Ruth, they had decided the centrality of government, even though it was a private company at the time, uh, the, their attitude to monopoly uh, and uh, how, to, how to make money yeah, that, through a licensing system uh, rather than through, uh, adver through advertising. So to get back to John Reith, uh, uh, one of the, uh, his central uh, ideas would be a certain obsession with efficiency, uh, whether in an administrative or an engineering sense. Uh, now, uh, perhaps, no doubt, unfortunately, the concept of efficiency is at the heart of his political uh, views. Um, but I will come to those in a moment. Very religious gentleman. Uh, he meant that he felt that he had uh, that God had chosen him to uh, have a particular role uh, in society. And indeed, he wrote in his diary in December 1922, when he got the job uh, as the first general manager of the British Broadcasting Company, I am profoundly thankful to God in this matter. It is all his doing. And so Reith would go on and invent the BBC. Obviously, he would have much more power than later director generals because nothing had been established, or very very few things had been had been had been uh, had been uh, 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 established. Here we have one of the very early logos used by the BBC, and you can see they intend to broadcast to the world, to the end, and to the to the end, end, uh, entire world. Uh, now, uh, having. Uh, the impression that uh, that he was doing God's work uh, also uh, affected his uh, attitude to the people who worked around him, and he was frequently criticised for being paternalistic or autocratic. And indeed, uh, 1930 in 1936, Clement Attlee, uh, 
uh, who had been a member of one of the committees studying uh, uh, broadcasting, uh, praised Reith for his remarkable qualities, but also said, I think he tends to be dictatorial and a little impatient of criticism. He rather likes to be surrounded by yes men, and I think he tends to rule a little by fear. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, the opinion of Clement uh, Attlee. Uh, and certainly this uh, authoritarianism had its reflection uh, uh, in uh, his view of certain uh, aspects of politics. Uh, for example, uh, what he wrote about Hitler uh, in the 1930s is, uh, to say the least, disconcerting. In July 1934, he wrote, I really admire the way Hitler has cleaned up what looked like an incipient revolt against him. And even in March 1939, as Czechoslovakia was occupied, Reith wrote, Hitler continues his magnificent efficiency. Now, the, these are comments, of course, made before the war, and most people who were not experts in politics uh, did not uh, uh, know how far Hitler was going to, get, uh, uh, going to go. But nevertheless, there was quite a lot of, uh, of evidence about, uh, about uh, Hitler's attitudes. Uh, and we cannot dis dismiss these remarks simply because of the great achievements of Reith in broadcasting. Uh, and indeed, uh, inside the organization, he often found himself to be no friend of the de democratic process. Trade unions, he uh, had very little time for. Uh, and indeed, in April 1922, he commented in his diary that trade unions are, and I quote, one of the greatest deterrents to the harmonious conduct of uh, industry. He was also a very strong supporter of the British Empire uh, and uh, can be uh, found to be making uh, uh, what would today be recognized as racist comments about uh, different countries who wanted some autonomy from uh, the British uh, Empire. And the final point I want to make about Reith is uh, uh, he had this huge project then of, of education and improvement uh, of the British people, uh, which uh, went along line with his uh, uh, deeply ingrained pres Presbyterian distrust of anything which was frivolous. Uh, and he was uh, was uh, determined that uh, the BBC would lift people up into into higher uh, levels uh, of um, of culture and, and education. And it, whereas entertainments, he believed that it was unfortunately necessary, although he said, and I quote, entertainment, pure and simple, quickly grows tame. If hours are to be occupied agreeably, it would be a sad reflection on human intelligence if it were contended that entertainment in the accepted sense of the term was the only means of doing so. Uh, he did have uh, some uh, time to encourage uh, um, innovation uh, within uh, with, with this brand new uh, uh, exciting means of radio because the, uh, the the people were extremely excited about getting radio and speaking into a microphone and being heard by hundreds of thousands or millions of people. It was a completely new idea for people. Uh, and indeed, uh, this gentleman, Val Gilgood, on the right, was a pioneer of radio drama. They, they received from playwrights hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scripts. And most of them they had to simply send back again uh, because um, they were not suitable for radio. They had been written by the stage and nobody knew how to uh, write a play for radio at the very, at the ve at the very beginning. Final point about Reith, he worked very hard to export the BBC model and he went to South Africa and he went to Australia to try to persuade them to uh, uh, leave the minimum amount of space for private commercial radio and the maximum amount of, amount of, state, uh, of space for public service radio, although his idea of public service was more the service of the state than uh, a, a more popular uh, view that we might uh, uh, find more more common uh, today. Let's move on to the next one. I will come back to John Reith when I talk about the 1920s, because of course he had a, a tremendous uh, influence then. But let's move on. Let's move on to the uh, the next one. Frederick Og Ogilvy, then who's there for four years, and you can see here a portrait of him from the National Portrait Gallery. Also privately uh, uh, educated, uh, and then a graduate of Oxford, and he became Director General at the age of 45. He had uh, uh, joined the war, the First World War, at the beginning. Two days after the announcement of the war, he joined as many middle-class uh, 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 men did. He sustained serious injuries and lost his left arm 
uh, and went back to university after the war, becoming a professor of economics. He was indeed one of the first British e econ economists to be interested in tourism, uh, not just for his holidays, but tourism as an economic sector. Uh, and he, he, he then spent four years as the, uh, as the um, director general of the BBC. Of course, he didn't have uh, the same huge influence uh, that Reith had, uh, but he was uh, uh, one of it. the highlights was that he recruited Lindley Fraser to head the BBC's German service. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, Lindley Fraser uh, uh, had a great success during the war uh, running the BBC radio broadcast to Germany uh, to uh, try to have some influence uh, among uh, German people against uh, uh, against Hitler. Uh, Ogilvy also uh, uh, defended the uh, independence of the of the BBC. Uh, rem remember, quite regularly for many for several decades, um, the government or people around government would say, "Oh, you know, well maybe the BBC it's it's no longer necessary. Let's abolish it. Let's just have private television, or let's have a minimum public uh, public television and radio." Of course. Uh, so it was not automatic that the BBC continued and continued. It, it had to be regularly defended against the idea that there was another way of doing things. And uh, uh, certainly Ogilvy, uh, Ogilvy did this. Uh, he later became principal of Jesus College, Oxford, and was a vocal critic of the post-war BBC. And indeed, right, I didn't mention it, but he also was very dissatisfied with what happened at the BBC after he left. Uh, uh, during the war, we had a very short, uh, uh, a couple of very short um, um, reigns, if you like, or uh, directorships. Uh, first of all, for one year, Cecil Graves and Robert Foote. Um, and then for another one year, Robert Foote on his own, because uh, Cecil Graves became, became very ill. So who were they? Cecil Graves was 50 years old and he had followed a military career. In fact, he'd spent the First World War in a prisoner of war camp, or almost all of it. Uh, but then he, he was already he was already in the army before the war began. Yes, it was a he was a military. He wasn't uh, uh, called up or, uh, or or and he didn't volunteer um, because there was a war. He was a, he was in a military career. Uh, and he joined the BBC as an administrator in 26, became uh, the director of the Empire Service, uh, and then succeeded uh, Ogilvy as director uh, general, and then had to leave because he, he was ill. Uh, as for Robert Foote, um, uh, he he uh, worked on decentralizing BBC man BBC management, essentially administ an administrator, uh, and he he left uh, just uh, one year uh, one year later to become the chairman chairman of the mining association. Now, so this is what were these are the people who were in charge during the war. Uh, but it's probably fair to say that during the war, more decisions were made by government than usually was the case. Uh, certainly, these uh, directors managed to avoid being completely taken over by government for day-to-day -day management. Um, and that is something we'll look at when we get to uh, the period um, on the war. Once the war is over then, uh, William Haley, well, not quite, uh, uh, towards the end of the war, William Haley will take over. And as you can see, he is there for eight years. So this is obviously much more, uh, he has much more uh, of an opportunity to influence the uh, future uh, of the BBC. He rose through the ranks uh, uh, he, uh, 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 and uh, became, um, sorry, uh, he previously had worked at the Manchester Guardian, where he had risen through the ranks and become the director of the Manchester Guardian, so an, an important newspaper. Um, and uh, he served for eight years as director general of the BBC before, before becoming editor, editor of the Times. So he was from the journalistic world. And what did he do uh, while he was uh, at the BBC? Well, a number of things, but certainly he was in charge of the uh, the important uh, transformation of radio uh, at the end of the war and the establishment um, of the three programs, the home service, the light program, and the third program. Uh, and I, I, I already put on the um, blog uh, a, an important uh, documentary about the third program. Uh, this was his idea of uh, how uh, culture uh, and radio should work. Uh, uh, he, he he said that he was hoping that people would listen to the light program and be gradually encouraged uh, 
to listen to the home service and then gradually encouraged to listen to the third program, the light program being the most popular uh, with more popular music, with more talk about hobbies or cooking, uh, uh, the home service being more serious and the third program being uh, theater, opera, classical music, and so on and so forth. Now he was still very much in an ideology which considers that the elite knows what the people want and the people do not. But this had set, this had softened uh, by the democratic demands of post-war Britain. This is the moment, 1945, six, seven, eight, when suddenly free doctors, free hospitals, social housing, food safety, vaccination campaigns, and many other changes show that ordinary people cannot be considered as having little or no value in the same way as they could be by the elite before the war. Now, the establishment of the welfare state in a Britain which had been bankrupted by the war, I think it was that the war cost 29% of Britain's to total wealth, uh, and Britain had to borrow money from the United States, which they finished paying back in the 21st century. And so it might be considered rather surprising that in a situation where obviously Britain had to give me no more money, that the money was found for the hospitals, for the social housing, for family allowances, for free glasses, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so, so on and so forth. One of the reasons was certainly the fear of the economic elite that the Second World War, like the First World War, would give rise to a series of revolutions. Indeed, there's one conservative uh, influential um, uh, commentator who said uh, after the Second World War, if you do not give the people uh, reform, they will give you uh, revolution. Uh, and so this was one of the reasons of, for the masses of, of reforms, but also even within broadcasting, it was necessary to have a little more uh, respect for uh, what people wanted. Uh, and indeed, in 1936, they had finally established audience research, asking people what they wanted. Reith was uh, opposed to audience research. Uh, he thought that the elite knew what the people needed. Now, if you look at Haley's Pyramid, the class bias jumps out at you. Nobody thought of calling the third program the heavy program and the and the light program, the fun program. Uh, uh, this ca and light program is slightly insulting vocabulary. Now, of course, it's no doubt true that working class people listen more to the light program. Uh, in the 1950s, working people worked 46 hours a week, only got 16 days holiday a year, and more than 70% of workers were in manual, manual work. Nine million worked in manufacturing. Uh, men and women, uh, and there were 800,000 miners. So you can see that, you know, life was certainly hard enough to want to listen to something perhaps light. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it, it's important not to exaggerate. There have always been uh, working class people who liked opera, uh, fewer than middle class people, but that's all, that's something which has already existed. So notice the difference with Reith. The Reith was more in favor of imposing on people listening to important cultural material, whereas uh, uh, Haley was more about uh, uh, encouraging them. Uh, and indeed he said, uh, Haley said, the listener is being induced through the years increasingly to discriminate in favor of things which are more worthwhile. Each program, that is each channel, at any given moment must be ahead of its public but not so much as to lose their confidence. So this is really a more moderate version of what Reith wanted, but Reith was not happy. He called it an absolute abandonment of what I stood for. We will come back to this uh, and notice that Post 19 on the teaching block is an indispensable documentary, no doubt a little over positive uh, about the third program. And here we have um, uh, a little uh, joke from the time, uh, from 46, uh, on the third program. And as you can see, uh, there's a gentleman um, pho phoning his wife. So uh, obviously a middle class uh, uh, gentleman, because otherwise he wouldn't have a phone. Um, no need to worry back, darling. Julian and I are thoroughly enjoying the third program. And the joke here, although it's from the Radio Times, so they know how to laugh at themselves, the joke here is the only way you can make children listen to the third programme, which is you know, opera, perhaps not ballet, but uh, opera, classical music and serious theatre, uh, is by tying them to, to, to a chair. Okay. So let's move on to the next gentleman. This is uh, Ian Jacob, uh, 1952 to 59. He came from a military officer's family. He was born in colonial India. Uh, and he was privately educated. 
we're getting used to this now. They all come from the elite. Here we have a portrait of him from the National Portrait Gallery uh, and the gentleman himself. Now, the most thing, important thing to happen uh, in the time of Jacob is the rise of television which was beginning to displace radio as the main broadcast medium. Although uh, it's important to note that the, the dates at which the number of people buying television and radio licenses were, uh, was higher than the number of people buying radio licenses is 1957. Uh, and so it's very important when we look at the history uh, of television, we always think of the BBC before the BBC when it was a monopoly before 1955. But most people never saw television in their houses uh, in this period. Uh, most people discovered television when there were two. Uh, when there were two choices. Now, uh, Jacob was lucky in that this was the post-war boom. There was lots of money around. Even the government found plenty of money uh, to give to the uh, BBC relatively. Uh, now, Jacob was an enthusiast of news and current affairs program uh, and was keen to uh, 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 keep uh, to the BBC's reputation of relative accuracy and relative uh, in, in, uh, impartiality. He did have one success, uh, is that he campaigned hard for the abolition of the 14-day rule. Now, the 14-day rule said you can't talk about anything, you can't discuss anything on the radio or on the television if Parliament is going to debate it in the next 14 days, the 14-day rule. So you can see that th this is a, obviously a, an elitist sort of rule. It's, you know, we don't want people discussing things that the important parliament is going to discuss shortly. Yes, it's a very, very interesting thing. We've got the opposite today, haven't we, where you, you get people uh, discussing at length um, uh, things which haven't yet uh, yet happened and, and speculating about them. And so this is a very, uh, very old fashioned rule in a way, but uh, Jacob worked very hard to get uh, this um, um, abolished. Uh, it was also during his uh, time that uh, the, uh, the, the first, um, uh, episode uh, of the uh, television um, uh, current affairs program, um, Panorama was shown. Now, Panorama was begun in 1953, basically one episode a week, about 50 minutes long on a different topic every week, yeah, news and current affairs. Uh, it is still going on today, and it is the longest running uh, television current affairs program in the world. You can find quite a lot of episodes on YouTube, probably too many, but I will be recommending you some of the most controversial ones because obviously, of course, of course, most weeks it was not controversial, but it's normal to look at some of the most controversial and see what that they can uh, teach us about the uh, history of the, B uh, the BBC. He was not always popular with the governments, uh, Winston Churchill, for example, who was, uh, 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 perhaps you remember, who became Prime Minister again in 1951 for a few years, uh, was not very happy in that he really thought, Winston Churchill really thought that broadcast media should be a tool of government rather than a forum of political analysis and criticism. Uh, and indeed, uh, um, uh, Jacob had problems with uh, Anthony Eden, Eden joined the 1956 Suez Crisis. If you've forgotten what it is, uh, look it up. It's not uh, not really an episode which uh, British people can be very proud of. Uh, the attempt to uh, in, to well the, the invasion of, of uh, part of Egypt in an attempt to uh, intimidate the the Egyptian government with the help of France and Israel. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, Anthony Eden, the Prime Minister, uh, thought that. When Britain was bombing Egypt, this information should not be on the BBC. Uh, and Jacob said, oh, no, that's, uh, that's not true. So Jacob was, of course, um, quite happy to put on the BBC uh, a vision of, of the Suez crisis, which was relatively favor favorable to Britain, but was not willing to say, OK, we're not talking about the bombing of, uh, of Egypt by, uh, by Britain. Uh, and this is what he said. If the BBC is found for the first time to be suppressing significant items of news, its reputation would rapidly vanish and the harm to the national in inter uh, interest would enormously outweigh any damage caused by displaying to the world the workings of a free democracy. And here we have a, uh, a cartoon about uh, uh, Suez uh, because at the, the end of the day, uh, fascinating story at the end of the day um, Egypt won politically out of the uh, invasion Britain and France had to go, had to go home uh, and so here you have this picture uh, of um, uh, Nasser who's just leaving uh, and what has he done with Britain and France he's put them in an Egyptian mummy uh, uh, sarcophagus 
Yes, uh, uh, so much that 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 he's wanted as a humorous political cartoon from the time, showing how Egypt. Uh, eventually humiliated Britain and France. Extremely important event because everywhere in Africa, uh, the British colonies and the French colonies were people saying, hey, if Egypt can humiliate Britain, maybe we should start thinking about how to get out of this colonial uh, situation. Now, uh, Eden was very, the Prime Minister of Britain, Anthony Eden, was very angry with the BBC uh, and uh, responded by cutting the budget for the overseas uh, service. Uh, because at that time, uh, the overseas service had separate funding from the Foreign Office. Uh, however, that didn't last very long. Eden himself was forced to resign because of the Suez, uh, uh, the, the Suez, the Suez scandal. Uh, and so uh, to finish with, uh, to finish with, you know, to finish with um, uh, Ian Jacob, uh, his period also uh, involved then the uh, the actual arrival of television in, in uh, uh, sorry the rise of television in a big way, uh, and uh, his uh, uh, plans included uh, regional television and uh, the request for a second channel for the BBC, which eventually, a few years after uh, Ian Jacob have left, will be established, and we will see this um, in the next chapter. Okay, so this was chapter 3b, uh, and it gave me time to talk about the director generals up to uh, 1960. Uh, chapter 4, which will be the next one, uh, unsurprisingly perhaps, uh, will uh, allow me to go on to uh, the other director generals and see uh, what were the main um, characteristics that they brought to the job. Thank you.